Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul, and I am a nerd, and I am here today with Mary Jo and Leanne, and this is our August 2011 water cooler, which is another word for our virtual user group meeting. Today we are talking about three different things, one of them very quickly because we're sneaking them all in there. Uh, we normally have two topics. Today we have three. And they all have to do with version 16. More and more people are getting version 16, either because they've requested it early or because they're just getting it in the normal course of distribution. And so we're going to start moving our focus to version 16. You might find that next months or even the next couple months we go back to topics that are kind of generic and not version specific. Uh, but slowly over the next month or two we are going to shift our focus to being on version 16. So today we are talking about three things. We are talking about emailing statements. We are talking about the new Matter Manager, which is very cool. It brings some billing information into Practice Master so that we can keep those pesky attorneys out of the billing system. And also we're going to talk about workflows. That's the one we're going to shorten up. We're really just going to kind of show you what they are, kind of get you thinking about them. Because workflows are, are so huge and so uh, powerful uh, that we really just want to kind of get you thinking about what you might be doing with them. And then as we go on, we'll be covering all sorts of different things that we think you could be doing with them. Before we get started, though, a little bit of house cleaning and housekeeping. Uh, the bathrooms are wherever the bathrooms are. Uh, I always go to, the, we don't have live CLE anymore, but I, I remember all the CLE I've gone to, and they tell you where the bathrooms are. You're on your own there. You're on your own for lunch, too, but uh, we can provide a form for you to ask your questions, and we have two ways for you to do it. Now, before I explain those two ways, if you have a big pane, a GoToWebinar pane that covers up, oh, maybe the right third or right quarter of your screen, you'll notice that uh, sticking out to the side is a little set of icons or buttons, and one of those buttons will look like arrows pointing to the right. If you click those arrows pointing to the right, they will uh, cause that big box to go out of the way and allow you to see everything that's on your screen. Once you do that, those arrows that pointed to the right will now point to the left, meaning that if you click them again, they'll bring that big box back into focus. Now, there are a couple things you can do in there. You can uh, type a question, or even with the big box collapsed, there's a, another icon on that uh, little set of buttons that juts off to the left that looks like a hand with an up, uh, arrow pointing upwards in front of it. That means raise your hand. Now, if you're not shy, you can raise your hand. And when Leanne, our humble moderator, sees that you've raised your hand, she will let me know. We will unmute you. You will ask your question. We'll make sure you get your question answered, and then we'll mute you again so you can go back to eating your Fritos or Doritos or perhaps Frito-Lay potato chips. Uh, if you instead are feeling shy, all you have to do is bring that big box into focus by, by using that little arrow to the left button to slide it out. And there's a place in there where you can type questions. Leanne, again, will be mon monitoring that. We'll find out what the question is. We'll answer it. And uh, if you have follow-up questions, just keep typing until we've got everything answered. So without any further ado, oh, we already have a question. Leanne, what do we have? Well, Catherine's having a little trouble dialing in. She's getting a busy signal. OK. Hmm. Any advice there? Well, I really don't. Uh, you, can t you can type a note back to her and ask her to uh, make sure she's got the right number and perhaps forward the, the number to her. If she still can't get connected, let her know that we can send her a link to the recorded version when it's available. And that brings up a good point. People tell me they, they wish they could have come. I just talked to somebody 10 minutes ago who wanted to come today but can't because of something that came up at the last minute. We record these. We've been doing it for about two and a half years. Sometime in the very near future, you'll see the unveiling of our new website, which will actually provide uh, these links 24-7 uh, without your having to get a link in the mail. Uh, but what we do now is if you signed up, if you register for the water cooler, you will, whether you attend or not, get a link in the email uh, to the recorded version when it's available. So if you ever find yourself in a position where you're either not sure you're going to be able to attend or you're positive that you won't be able to attend, sign up anyways. And that will ensure that, at least for the time being, until these become available to everyone on our newly uh, developed website, uh, that will ensure that you get an email with that link. So 
Without any further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Mary Jo, who is going to talk about emailing statements. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Paul said, one of the new features in uh, version 16 is emailing statements. Now, this is different than what you have now. Right now, when you go to generate statements on the option tab, uh, you can come in and you can say that you want to create PDFs for individual statements, and then you link those to an email and you send those out. This feature that we're going to talk about in 16 is actually emailing statements directly to the client from the billing process. So what we're, the first thing that you're going to do is you need to set up some email templates. Just like you set up statement templates um, for your statement um, when you're saying whether you want to show fees or you want to show um, costs in a certain way, we have to set up an email template to, or, or more. You can have more than one saying what we want the template to say. So in our example, here's some fields that you can fill in with different information. And I'm going to show you a sample one. This is our general email that we send out. Um, and you can see that we've filled in some different things here that we want it to um, come from Paul Purdue. We want the address to be Paul Purdue at Attorney Computer Systems. If they reply, we want it to come back to him. Now, these could be different for your firm. You might have an administrator that you want it to um, be replied to, but you want your firm name to be who it's from. So these are things that you can personalize. And you can set up as many templates as you want. So if you have different clients that have different needs, you can set up different templates to say different things. So you can also do additional recipients. You can carbon copy yourself or someone in the firm. You can blind carbon copy you. Those are all options there that you can set right in the template. Um, you also can uh, adjust your subject line with different fields here. So in this case, we've got our subject line saying that it's a statement dated. And then we have some fields over here that are available to plug in. And we have just chosen statement date. So whatever that statement date is on there, that's going to automatically fill in my subject line. Same thing with the body. We can say you know, a certain statement um, or sentence here that we want. We've always just said attached. You'll find a current statement. And this is our signature. You can modify that however you want. And then you just save these templates in there. You give them some names, just like you would with a statement template. These are your email templates. Here's another one that's in here from the infrastructure nerd, which of course is still Paul. But he's got a little bit of a different um, email address to go back to. So you can decide what you want here, and you can design these ahead of time. But you're going to want those statement templates in place before we assign it to the client. And this could be assigned on a client-by-client -client basis, so a matter-by-matter -ba -matter basis as well. Um, so if I come in here under my client now, and I'm going to just use our generic ACS client here. We've got an attorney computer systems generic client. Um, and if I come over here to my billing preferences screen, you'll see that down here now I have statement delivery options. And the key when you're emailing statements um, is to make sure that you actually have an email defined for the contact that you're going to actually send to. Um, this is how it comes out of the box. It's going to bill to um, Attorney Computer Systems because that's the address name I have out there. And it's going to default to just mailing the statement. Every statement that you want to email, you'll have to come in and you'll have to tell it, yes, mail it and email, or change this to email, or you can add an additional address here. So maybe you mail it to one and you email it to somewhere else. You can define that here. So I want to make sure back on my address screen that I've got an email here that it's going to go to that particular contact. Once I've defined that, I'm going to go back to my billing options, and I'm going to edit my default here. That will bring up a window here that's asking me, how do you want this statement delivered? I can tell it that I want it to be mailed or emailed. And then I can tell it if I want it both. And then I can give it some parameters here if I want to print the client's name on there or print the bill to. Um, if you're mailing, you're going to want to make sure that there is an address in here. If you're emailing, we're going to want to make sure that that email is defaulting in there. And you can see that it does have Paul Purdue. And then I can come down here and specify which email template I'm using. So for this particular client matter, I'm using the general. If it were another client, I'm using you know, something else, I can choose that here. If you want to add a different, you know, if I don't want to just have it mailed and emailed, I can just come in and add. And I can add another. And I can bill to a different contact. So um, in the bill to name, I can send this to a different contact. So if I have you know, two different contacts listed on my 
um, client by the client and then a different primary contact, I can actually mail the statement to one or mail and email to one and then email to another. Okay, we have a question, Mary Jo. Mm -hmm. Sharon would like to know how many postal addresses can we add? Right now it's just two. It's the same as what we had before where you have your bill to out here or you can duplicate or you can bill to somewhere else. It's still just the two. But now you've got the ability to email as well to two different addresses. Mary Jo, if you could hit cancel for me. You'll notice that there is a scroll bar um, right here. So that means that the people at STI are planning to make this more than two. And I know that the reason that they let it uh, be released initially with just two was programming considerations. It uh, may seem like a simple thing to allow more, but it's really not. It's actually rather far-reaching. So they've designed the screen in such a way as to, to anticipate the fact that there will eventually be more than two available, but right now it is just two. All right, I'm going to go back to adding. Um, just to show you that I could choose a totally separate contact from somewhere else. I mean, I could scroll down. This is my complete contact list, and I could pick someone else on here, and I'm all in my ads here. I don't know what Paul has. There we go. Um, so if I had the ABC Law Firm, I could choose them as another contact that I want to do. And as long as they've got an email defined in there, I'll be able to email the statements to them as well, or mail and email. Again, you've got all those same options with a separate address. And it doesn't have to be a contact that's actually linked on the contact page on the first page. It could be a different contact. And as long as in the contact record they have an email under email one, you can attach them here. So I'm going to cancel this. And then the last thing on this screen, you can also use a password to protect the PDF statements when they're emailed. So you can put a password in there. Your client would have the password. They could then email or right, the, they could just then open that with the password. So that protects that there. So once we have this set up, when we do our regular billing, I'm going to go in and um, I'm going to prepare a quick bill for Attorney Computer Systems and update it because we have to do that first. And I'm just going to put everything. I'm going to bill a final bill. Say OK. And I'm not going to print it. I'm just going to look at it real quick. I do have to print it? No, I can just look at it. There we go. So there's that, and then we'll get out of there, and then we will update that statement. Say OK. And there it's update. And now once I get over here, I can cancel, I can get in here, and when I go to my statement tab and go to my email statements, OK, Paul, you're right. He's telling me I really ten, have to Ten print points it. for Paul who said you have to actually print it first. I do not remember having to I'll mute that. myself again now. <laughs> That's a good thing I didn't bet him like I usually do, because then I would have lost. So I am actually going to print this statement. Could we perhaps take a quick look at the terminology here, printer email statements window, mm -hmm. but it, it implies that you're not previewing, you're okaying to that selection there. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to print your statement out. Then I'm going to go back and update my statement. It's actually updated, so I don't think I can print it. I have to unupdate it. OK. Let me get back in here. Client manager. Unupdate my statement. So this dog runs into a butcher shop and grabs a roast <laughs> off the counter, and butcher recognizes the dog is belonging to a lawyer who lives upstairs in one of the lofts. So he calls the lawyer, and he says, hey, if your dog grabbed a roast off my counter, would you be liable for the cost of the meat? And the lawyer says, sure. How much was the roast? And the butcher says, $7.99. So the next day, the butcher gets an envelope in the mail from the lawyer. And in the envelope is a check for $7.99. Uh, I'm trying to hurry, guys. I really am. <laughs> and a bill for a telephone <laughs> consultation for $75. OK, thank you. Here you go, Mary Jo. OK. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to build this again. <laughs> I tried to save you from a lawyer joke, but it just wasn't quick enough. All right, so we're going to build a final bill. We actually will print it. OK, and now I'm going to go ahead and update. And hopefully I did change that to being email. I think I did. All right. So now, I get back over to my statement tab, and I go to my email statements. See, I don't think I 
saved it. I, oh gosh, hello. You have to actually save it in the client before it will stay. Go to statement options. I'm sorry, billing preferences. Yeah, I didn't save my email, so here we go. We're emailing it, and now I think it does go there, Paul. All right, so when you go here, and we go ahead and let me update this. No, they don't want another lawyer joke, Paul. Okay, so we have our email statement checked. We're going to go ahead and generate our statement. Go to our options tab, make it final. Say OK. Go over and update that statement. Now that the statement is updated and I go to our billing preferences, I'm sorry, our statements tab, email statements, there's our statement. So if you're doing this in mass, you know, you have, once you've set all of these clients to be email statement, you're just going to run your final bills like you always will. You'll print the ones that, you know, are going to be mailed. You'll hit print. It will, it will dump all of the ones that are going to be emailed on this list. And if you're using pre-bill tracking, you're going to be kind of familiar with this list. Um, it's the same type of thing. You can hold and review the emails you want to send, just like you can hold and review pre-bills in pre-bill tracking. So I can mark this that I want to go ahead and review that, and then I can send the reviewed when I'm ready. I can view and I can edit individual emails. So if I come in here and I look at this one and I decide I want to add a personal note to this particular one, I can view it and come in and I can add another you know, sentence or two, whatever I want to tell this particular matter. So I can look at that and you'll see it's attached that file. So that is emailing statements. Um, once you've done that, this list will clear. Um, you can also sort it just like in pre-bill tracking by different timekeepers, statement dates, things like that. Once they're all sent, um, this will clear out and you'll be all set. And well, that is exciting. Sorry for the delay. And some people have heard this because I talk about it in my short conversation that I've been having with people about version 16, but uh, if you're getting version 16 just to do this, because you do a lot of them, uh, don't install it two days before your billing cycle. Install it the day after, because it does take some time to get set up. And as you've seen with Mary Jo, it takes a little time to get used to, too. So you really want to get a lot of that whole bit of time between your one billing cycle, and then you install the update, and then you have all that time in between to get everything set up. We had a client that had uh, was personally sending 542 of these by hand every month, and she was very excited, and she installed it two days before, and her billing cycle was delayed by about three or four days because of that. So just be careful there. Now, another thing that really has been a big uh, popular item in version 16 is something that's called the Matter Manager. Now, when we're in Practice Master, which I am not right now, so I'll get out of tabs. When we are in Practice Master, uh, we've always shown people that the way to go to the screen where you can see clients is right here. Now, yours may look a little different. We've got ours, ours kind of set up with colors alternating and, and two rows per client, but these are the clients. And if we pull up attorney computer systems, we can see details and we can see all the calendar items and the journal items and docket, document management if you're using that, and fees and costs and contacts and people. And we have a couple other tabs called Incidents and Opportunity. Um, but that's a little cumbersome. And there's a lot of jumping back and forth. You have to really you know, go from one screen to another. If you want to look at the journaled emails, or you want to then look at the fees, and then maybe you want to look at certain bits of detail. You want to look up somebody's telephone number, which might be over here on people. Um, that stuff is all over the place. And so one of the things that STI did was they developed this thing called the Matter Manager. And it's right here, at least on our system. If you look back at your task list, it's, it's going to be right out here on the main tab. It's also going to be here under the client tab called the Matter Manager. And this is what it is. It is a single place where you go and you can see, at least when you've chosen the right thing, everything there is to see about this client. 
Now, if I may, I'm going to pick somebody different real quick. I'm going to go to Waldegger. And the reason is that I've got more than just the client contact and the client themselves to find for Waldegger. I've got some people listed. There's Jim and Mike and Loretta, and then there's the firm itself. And so down here we have the contacts. And as I hover over each contact, I get this little box that pops up and shows me the whatever contact information I have for that particular person. Up here we get the client contact contact, or here's the matter contact, and here's the client contact. Over here, we get whatever we've chosen. So remember I told you before, when we're in a mode where we want to uh, look at this email, and then look at this journal note, and then look at this fee entry, we have to jump from screen to screen. Not true here. All of these things come up combined into one screen so that you can see all your fees, all your notes, all your emails in sort of a chronological order. Now the real kicker, I'm going to go back to attorney computer systems here. Oops, it's uh, ACS. ACS. There we go. Come on. The real kicker is this thing. Under here we have this thing called a billing summary. Uh, for years, maybe even decades, attorneys have really wanted to be able to see certain key bits of information when they're in this matter management mode, when they're in practice master. Now, if you are a uh, if you are a, an administrator, you know that you really don't want attorneys going into tabs for most purposes, uh, except maybe to enter fees. Although a lot of firms have attorneys entering fees directly into practice master. This gives us the ability for an attorney to come in and look at this very summary sort of information. What do they owe? What's work in process? What's their current balance? Do they have a funds balance? Um, who's the primary and tech, uh, timekeeper? What's the primary billing category? What's their last payment? What's their last bill? How does their accounts receivable break down? And what's their trust account information? all of this on one screen, along with everything else that you can see. Uh, when you're not looking at the billing summary and you're looking instead at all activity, you're looking at everything but the billing summary. So one place where attorneys can go see all the people, all the billing information that they usually need. There may be certain instances where they need a little bit more than what's showing here. Uh, and then all the other journal-related um, information, notes, emails, calendar items, fees, costs. And we can break that down. We can say, well, show me just people. Don't have any people. Should have gone back to Waldinger. Or show me just um, notes, journal. Or show me just the billing summary. Or show me just the fees or just the costs. Or, of course, show me everything. So that's the matter manager in a nutshell. It allows an attorney to be able to see anything that they want to see within reason. It doesn't show all the detail. It won't show certain fields that aren't tied to the journal, things like that. But it's, it's a, a big chunk of what an attorney wants to see, and it's all on the same screen. And then down here we have the ability to look at uh, a matter-specific calendar or to in, in more of a graphic view because it's one thing to look at the calendar items in that view where they're uh, listed, but it's quite another thing to be able to pull it up in a, a view like that. Or uh, to be able to go to the report writer and run reports for this client, or to be able to go to the tabs three client manager if you've given the attorneys access, which is where they can see a whole host of other information if you've given them access to that. Or to be able to start a timer for this client, or to do document assembly, or if they had World Docs integration turned on, that item could also show up down here. So all of that in one screen. Um, a lot of thought went into this. This one billing screen, I know that the people at STI talked to at least three or four of our clients to ask specifically what attorneys were looking for, and I think they did a pretty good job of getting the information that's relevant to an attorney when they're in a matter management or a practice management sort of mode on this screen. Now, any questions, Liam? 
the last thing we're going to talk about today is workflows. Workflows are something that happen when something else happens. Now, Mary Jo and I use these because we need to keep track of who is doing what for who. So we have what we call our ticketing system. And we have, you know, for instance, all of um, Lewis Wagner's tickets in here, or all of Norris Joplin's or Fraser's or Riley's. And what we do here, I'm going to go to a new one, we're simply using the tasks. And we say that we want to assign a task to Mary Jo to uh, check on Deb's reporting issue. This is a standard task within the calendar within Practice Master. And I can give it a certain date, and I can give it a certain time, just like you can. And we're going to say this is for attorney computer systems that we're doing this. We happen to have this set up. Oops, I need to select attorney computer systems. Thank you. And we uh, have it set up so that when we're doing this, it's just a matter of how we do it. We assign them to a user project and then another user, you know, Mary Jo or Paul or whoever it is that's doing it. And here's the key. When I say it's assigned by me to Mary Jo, Mary Jo, are you logged in as yourself? Okay. And I save that. We have an e-note that's going to pop up that says this task has been assigned to you. Now, let's assume, pretend that I did, created this on my computer, but now we're sitting at Mary Jo's computer, and without her even knowing that I've done that, uh, it saw that I assigned that task to Mary Jo, so it assigned it, and I sent her this e-note automatically, and it's what we call an e-notify, meaning that it's also got the calendar record linked right to it, so she can click on it and see it right underneath. Well, it already was underneath, but that's, this is a function of having called it up through the note. So that all happened because I saved a record or added a new record to the calendar file that had been assigned to Mary Jo. We've also got a workflow that when Mary Jo or I change anything in that record that's been assigned to Mary Jo, it sends an e-note to me and to Mary Jo to let us know that one of these two fields, either this comments field or this date completed field, has been changed. So if I say, um, now we'll pretend I'm Mary Jo. I press F5 in here, so it puts in the user's uh, the date, the time, and the username. And then I type uh, talked to Deb and reviewed all reports. And then we have a thing where we say done, meaning that we know that it's, it's done. And now when I save this, because that field there changed, uh, both Paul and Marie Jo, and you can't see the one that's coming to me, but I can because I'm on my computer. An e-note pops up to let Mary Jo know that this record's changed, and an e-note pops up letting me know that this record has changed. And um, that's one of many, many ways that we use e-notes. Now, I am going to, uh, uh, yeah, now e-notes e themselves are a CSV feature. Mary Jo is reminding me. But workflows are not. Workflows are something that is all over in Practice Master. I believe it's only in Premiere, but most of our clients have Premiere. So here's one. Here are all the e-notes that we have for assigned to and changed for. Uh, so the one when I assigned it to Mary Jo, this is the uh, workflow that made that happen. And you'll notice that I'm not really moving my cursor right now because although I have reformed to a certain extent, I do still have to snooze, oh, let's say 20 alarms of, oh, every once in a while. So I'm done with that, done snoozing my alarms, and we're going to go in here. We're going to look at this very briefly. What this says is that it's called assigned to Mary Jo. It's for all records. And the event that we're tracking is that a record is added or changed in the client file, on the calendar file right there. And when a specific field called assigned to is changed so that the value afterwards is Mary MJ Blum, which is Mary Jo's username, it will then send an e-note to Mary Jo, and that e-note happens to say, this task has been assigned to you. And we're using the e-notify feature, and it's automatically being sent, meaning I, as a user who creates this, 
calendar item, this task for Mary Jo, and assigns it to her, I don't see anything happen. I just save the record, and unbeknownst to me, or, you know, I know it's going to happen, but I'm not bothered by anything. It just goes right away and sends an e-note to, to Mary Jo. So that's how that works. Now, obviously, there's the ability to filter and to select which fields are changing and what they were before and what they were after. There's a lot of power here. And I don't begin to assume that everybody understands exactly all the different things you can do with workflows. But this is just kind of a wet your appetite sort of thing. Workflows are something that happen when a record's added, a record's changed, they can be initiated by a user, they can be done in a variety of circumstances, they can happen automatically, and they can do other things. You might have a workflow that when a statute of limitation state is posted to a screen here, it automatically grows out and creates a corresponding calendar item. You might have it set so that when a calendar record is created, it automatically goes out and, and looks for who it should be created for based on the matter. Lots of different things that could happen here. Lots of different ways to use these. We will go through these in a lot of different ways as the year progresses and into 2012 in different ways to use workflows. Any questions, Leanne? Yeah. Yes, I have a, one question. How do you add a field to specific field, um, the specific field drop-down menu? Right here, once you choose it, the select fields becomes active, and then it lets you choose which field it is that you're looking for a change. Now, in our example, let's go to the one where it changes because this wasn't what it was. Let me go to this one here. I'm not going to change this. I have a workflow that lets me know when anything um, that I've assigned has been changed so that if it gets marked complete or if it gets a note in that comments field. And we have it set so that it looks at the two fields, date completed and comments. Those are the only things it's looking for changes in. So what this one says is, if a record is changed and one of these two fields is changed, it then sends an e-note to me because this is the one for records that were identified as being uh, assigned by me to somebody else, either Leanne or Mary Jo. If either of these two fields that I've selected in this drop-down or in this box here change, it will automatically send an e-note to me linking me to that record saying something changed in this particular task. So if Mary Jo does what I asked her to do and puts a completed date in, it will send me an e-note. If Mary Jo uh, puts a note in there saying, hey, I tried to call Deb today, but she wasn't available, and I made a, uh, I sent her an email saying I'd try her back tomorrow, uh, that, since it's a change to that other field, the comments field, will trigger a uh, a, a, an e-note coming to me to let me know that that record's changed. Any more questions, Leanne? Okay. There we have it. Emailing statements, the matter manager, and workflows, all in a little bit under, you know, 35 minutes. Um, of course, we will be back next month, September, on the last Monday of the month. And we don't have our topics chosen yet, but as you know, we will let you know with an email the Thursday before when we have our topics. and. Remember, whether or not you're going to be there, if you're interested in the topics, go ahead and sign up for the, the uh, water cooler, sign up for the virtual user group meeting, and that way you'll get the recording even if you're not there. Okay? Everybody have a good afternoon. We'll see you next month.